far back as I could remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. After feeling betrayed by partner in crime and fellow Westies member and boss Jimmy Coonan for breaking his word to take care of Mickey Featherstone's family, amongst other reasons while Featherstone was in prison, Featherstone decided to link up with fellow Westies crew member Billy Beatty, who had been in hiding after Coonan put a contract on his life, because while Coonan was locked up, his wife Edna, who was also Beatty's ex-girlfriend, showed up to Beatty's apartment trying to hook up with him and when he rejected her, she told Coonan Beatty came on to her. Mickey told Beatty he felt Coonan might be looking to kill him as well, and that they should team up and hit Coonan first. Beatty agreed, and in a follow-up meeting at Mickey's job at the Erie Transfer, Mickey gave Beatty a 32 caliber pistol wrapped in a towel to take him out, but Beatty couldn't bring himself to do it alone, and that's when more Westies members were brought in on the murder plot. Jimmy McElroy, Kevin Kelly, and Kelly Shannon had all recently told Mickey they too were tired of cooning and agreed he needed to go. The men went as far as to drive around with loaded guns looking for cooning in spots he was known to frequent and even drove by his house in Jersey but never spotted him on that day. Before Featherstone would get his chance to kill Coonan, he would be getting arrested and framed for the Michael Holly murder which led Mickey to believe one of the guys he and Beatty brought in on the Coonan murder plot had probably told Coonan of Mickey's plans, so in response, Coonan set him up for the murder to get him off the streets and out of the way. On the day of Holly's murder, there was a van with two delivery drivers driving behind the shooters that seen the whole shooting take place. They were driving down West 35th Street behind a beige station wagon, when out of nowhere the station wagon slammed on the brakes coming to a halt when they witnessed a man who they would later identify and point out in a police lineup as Mickey Featherstone jump out, screw a silencer on a pistol, and shoot a construction worker later identified as Michael Holly five times and then jump back in the car and drive off. The men who witnessed the hit would later swear it was Mickey who was the shooter but in reality it was Billy Boken. On top of those two men, another two witnesses were located by police. Two construction workers who were walking on 35th Street the day of the hit and seen the whole thing were brought into the 10th precinct in Manhattan for a police lineup. April 26, 1985, the day after the Michael Holly hit, while Mickey was on his way to his eerie transfer job with Sissy, who was six months pregnant, and their niece Esther in the Oldsmobile station wagon to pick up his paycheck, his mind was racing with the weird coincidences that took place the day before having a bad feeling that something wasn't right with the Holly hit. The way he was called to a meeting at the same spot the hit took place, and them renting the same car as him from the same place his car was rented, was way too suspicious for Featherstone. And as it would turn out, he would be proven right when cops swarmed his car from every direction with more police than he'd ever seen in one place. As Mickey stepped out of the station wagon, the cops ran down on Featherstone with their guns drawn, and the detectives pushed Mickey against the chain link fence and cuffed him and told him he was under arrest. Mickey asked the detectives what the fuck he was being arrested for, but they wouldn't tell him anything. Fast forward two and a half weeks later, on May 13, 1985, Mickey was dragged in by the detectives for a police lineup. Because of the Westies' reputation of the Westies having witnesses suspiciously disappear, the detectives took extra precaution during the lineup. Featherstone's lawyer wasn't allowed to know the names of the witnesses, and one detective recalled the police put brown paper bags over the heads of the two witnesses with holes cut out for the eyes, which the detective stated was something he'd never seen in all of his years. One witness couldn't identify anyone, but the other witness pointed out Mickey Featherstone. Ken Aronson, Mickey Featherstone's longtime lawyer who was closely affiliated to the Westies working as their lawyer, but also was emotionally attached to Mickey Featherstone. Aronson represented Mickey for years, but developed a personal relationship with him and would speak on the phone with him for hours trying to convince him to go legit. But Aronson, who lived on Long Island, was also enamored with the gangster lifestyle, was said to live vicariously through Mickey. 
Aronson had also developed personal relationships with other members of the Westies, which included Billy Boken. Two weeks following Featherstone's lineup, Aronson was invited to Boken's wedding at the Sacred Heart Church in Hell's Kitchen, where Boken, who was broken up and in tears over framing his friend for the Holly murder, confessed to being responsible for the setup and murder of Holly. Aronson told Boken not to say anything about the hit, telling him it, would, it wouldn't exonerate Mickey, but only get Boken charged as a co-conspirator. Aronson informed Mickey and no one else, but apparently, the news of Boken confessing to Aronson made it all around Hell's Kitchen, also reaching Sissy Featherstone, who would catch up with Aronson a few weeks later while he was eating at a Chinese restaurant, where she would press him. Sissy said to Aronson, I told you he wasn't guilty, to which he responded telling Sissy, no, he's not innocent. Boken only says he pulled the trigger, but Mickey knew about it. He said to Sissy, Mickey should have stayed away, he shouldn't have been so nosy. Sissy got mad and told Aronson he wasn't being nosy. He was told by Kenny Shannon and Kevin Kelly to meet him at that exact location. A few months later, while Featherstone was in his C-95 cell block in Rikers Island, he called Billy Boken on the phone and asked him about the hit. And that's when Boken confessed to Mickey he had worn a disguise. He said he put makeup over his big red birthmark he had on his face. He used eyeliner to darken his mustache. He wore a blonde wig and put on sunglasses and a painter's hat. When Mickey demanded to know why, Boken told Mickey it was Kevin Kelly who planned and plotted the whole thing and had Kenny Shannon drive the car. When Mickey asked Kevin Kelly about it, he claimed Boken never had a disguise on and told Mickey the cops were making it up to get everyone to turn on each other. After thinking it over for a while, Mickey would eventually come to the conclusion the only reasonable explanation was that Boken was telling the truth and he knew deep down Coonan had to be responsible for the plot against him. Mickey concluded Coonan had either did it because he heard about Mickey plotting and attempting to kill him or for refusing to do the three hits Coonan asked him to do if it wasn't for those reasons. Possibly the Italians were asking Coonan to get rid of him, but whichever reason it was, Mickey's mind was made up. Coonan was responsible. By March of 1986, Featherstone, who was on trial, had been getting high on coke and weed that Sissy was smuggling into him by slipping a balloon in his mouth when they would kiss during their visits. Started to suspect his lawyers as being in on the conspiracy against him. After Boken offered to come in and admit to the setup, and he even showed up in the disguise he used during the hit, and Mickey's lawyers blocked him from entering the courtroom and sent him home. Featherstone was convinced Coonan had gotten to them. They even put Kevin Kelly on the stand in Mickey's defense, even though Mickey told his lawyers it was a bad idea. Featherstone would be proved right when he was found guilty of the Michael Holly murder and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison on March 29, 1986. After being led back to his cell following the verdict, while Mickey was staring at the bar surrounding him, he realized that if Coonan wasn't the one who set him up, the construction worker who came in and testified against Mickey in the final phase of his trial, claiming to have been a witness, would have been clipped by the Westies long before he had the chance to point Mickey out from the stand, proving to Featherstone he was no longer a priority of Coonan or the Westies. In fact, Mickey even believed Coonan may have paid the man to identify him to police in the first place. Mickey also pondered the irony of how he basically beat the three murder cases in his past for which he was guilty of, but of course he would get found guilty for the one murder he didn't commit. But anyway, at this point, Mickey Featherstone, realizing his fate was sealed and nobody was coming to his aid, contemplated the one option he never fathomed. He came to the conclusion the only way out of the situation was gonna be to cooperate against his old pals who set him up for the fall. Although Mickey never actually gave up any information or struck up any deals with the feds, he had considered working out a deal prior to being convicted of the Holly murder. In late 1984, a couple of weeks prior to Coonan being released from prison, while Mickey was still trying to walk the straight and narrow, he came to the realization that there is no real way for a gangster to just walk away from the life, especially when you're tied in with the murderous crew like the Westies and a boss like Jimmy Coonan. So during a conversation with his father discussing the same topic, his father, Charlie Boyle, asked Mickey for his permission to reach out to the feds for him just to at least sit down with them and hear what they had to say, which Mickey agreed. That call was never returned, but about a year later, in November of 1985, 
Mickey himself reached out to the former assistant U.S. attorney Ira Block, who prosecuted him in his 1979 counterfeit money conviction, feeling that Block seemed like someone he could trust. Block put Mickey on to special investigator for the U.S. attorney of the Southern District of New York, Jim Nunes, who then came and visited Featherstone and Rikers to discuss the possibility of Mickey getting his Michael Holly murder conviction overturned, which he was falsely convicted of. In exchange for getting the conviction overturned, Mickey would have to give up information on Coonan and other members of the Westies. A few months after Mickey's talk with Jim Nunes, Nunes returned to Rikers to pick Featherstone up and transport him to an undisclosed hotel room in New York's Westchester County, where he would be met by his wife, Sissy, his freshly appointed government attorney, John Cayley, along with two federal prosecutors, an assistant DA, as well as about a half dozen NYPD and FBI agents. The purpose of the meeting was in Mickey's case to get the feds to look into the Holly murder so they could help him get the case overturned. And for the feds, they wanted Featherstone's knowledge of the crimes the Westies were involved in, as well as information on other members of organized crime. The first order of business for the feds was getting Mickey to understand that in order for them to step in and help him, Mickey would have to agree to plead guilty to a RICO charge. In exchange for pleading guilty to the RICO charge, Mickey would still be looking at a 20 year sentence. But with his cooperation, he would more than likely receive a much lighter sentence. The prosecutor asked Featherstone's lawyer if Sissy and Mickey would be willing to wear a wire and have their phones tapped so they could get the actual killers admitting to the crimes in their own voice, which they agreed to. And the feds also offered to relocate his wife and kids. The FBI issued Sissy Featherstone a 6x6 FBI tape recorder for her to turn on and off at her own discretion, being that while Mickey was away, Kevin Kelly, Kenny Shannon, and Billy Boken were in constant contact with Sissy, bringing her Mickey's cut of the Westies' profits, and in the process, Sissy would lead the conversations into the guys talking about the Holly murder and other various crimes being committed by Coonan and other members of the Westies, as instructed by the FBI. As for Mickey, he would continue to serve out his time in jail as if nothing had changed, even though he was now a cooperating witness, and the feds would monitor and record his telephone calls, as well as place recording devices in the visiting room when Mickey would receive visits from various Westies members. Within a couple of weeks of Mickey agreeing to cooperate, Sissy got Kelly and Shannon discussing the Holly murder, placing Boken as the shooter, which was enough to exonerate Mickey alone, but the feds wanted to gather as much info as possible. On May 16th, less than four weeks after the agreement Featherstone made with the FBI, he received a visit from Kevin Kelly and Kelly's friend Larry Palermo at Rikers Island. The feds placed a bug behind a picture above where Kelly and Palermo were placed to sit. During their conversation, Mickey brought up a newspaper article he had seen that involved a Carpenters Union official named John O'Connor who was shot asking Shannon if it was the Westies who did the job, because according to Mickey, the shooting looked like the work of his former comrades, to which Kelly told Mickey it was them who did the hit, stating it was done for the Italians, more specifically, Dan Marino and John Gotti. O'Connor was hit three times in the legs and once in the butt, surviving the hit as he was supposed to. Gotti was eventually charged and acquitted of the shooting. And as for Mickey, he would get the last piece of evidence he needed to have his conviction overturned when Sissy met with Billy Boken himself on May 18th at the 9th Avenue International Food Festival, where Boken would bury himself, telling Sissy all about the hit, making it very clear it was him who was responsible and Mickey had nothing to do with it. In one part of the conversation, Boken was quoted, I was in the car. He didn't see nothing. I jumped out, boom. I just shot him. One, two, three, four, five, back in the car. 10 seconds, no more. On September 5th, just five months after being convicted of Michael Holly's murder, Francis Thomas Featherstone, AKA Mickey Featherstone, would be brought before the same judge who convicted him in the same courtroom he was convicted in. And the same assistant DA who convicted him in the case, Jeffrey Schriegel, now part of a motion to have Featherstone's conviction overturned on the grounds of new evidence. Schriegel, who had been promoted to the Rackets Bureau after winning the conviction against Featherstone, told the judge the people were now convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that it was Billy Boken who killed Michael Holly on April 25, 1985, 
and not the previously convicted Mickey Featherstone. And with that, the conviction was overturned. From there, Mickey began debriefings with Richie Egan, an investigator for the U.S. Attorney's Office, who was also there for Mickey's arrest in the Harold Whitehead murder in the 70s, and had a lot of knowledge on the Westies crew. On top of Egan, Featherstone would also be questioned by many different law enforcement organizations, sometimes lasting six to eight hours a day. Finally, in December of 1986, law enforcement finished making their arrest on the 14-count, 10-person indictment for taking part in a racketeering conspiracy, which included 16 murders, conspiracy to commit murder, and attempted murders dating back 20 years. The indictment also included charges of gambling, extortion, loan sharking, counterfeiting, income tax evasion, and other things. The feds rounded up everyone except Kevin Kelly and Kenny Shannon, but they would turn themselves in a few months later. 